Stanford University. I know I've turned that light off. <laughs> well, uh, welcome again. The topic that I had uh, selected was political change in Latin America. There's been some uh, important elections recently. Although I realized right before I came here, I'm not actually talking about Latin America. I'm talking about Ibero America. And somehow, oh, let's see, we had another issue here at the top of the screen, right? Somebody figured it out for me. The screen just needs to go down. Up, oh. Ah. There you are. So anyway, what's the difference between Latin America and Ibero-America? Well, not much, but Latin America, strictly speaking, includes French-speaking areas like Haiti. So Ibero-America just means Spanish and Portuguese-speaking countries of America. So I wanted to limit myself somehow, so that hence I have a sinuous line here. Uh, eliminating Belize and Haiti and islands in the Caribbean, and I'm not going to talk about it. So I'll talk about the Spanish and Portuguese-speaking countries. Uh, there has been quite a remarkable transformation in Latin American politics over the last 20 years, a real movement towards democratization, uh, as we'll see later on. Some 20, 30 years ago, most countries in Latin America were not democracies. Now, virtually all of them are. Uh, Cuba certainly isn't, and we certainly have question marks in countries like Venezuela. But overall, there's been this big movement towards democracy. And I don't think it's been really heralded enough or talked about enough. It's not completely secure in every Latin American country, but in a number of them, it has become quite uh, secure. And I'll give you some public opinion polling on those issues a little bit later. More recently, we've seen a, real, uh, we've seen a movement, self described as a movement to the political left. And that's been true in many Latin American elections. But I think it's a little more complicated than that. I think what I would say that we're really saying is that in many countries we've seen something of a movement towards the center, where political parties and most of Latin America, like those in Europe, are keen to uh, identify themselves as center-left or center-right, rather than just left or right, trying to seek a common ground. And you have parties on the left saying, well, yes, we're on the left, but we're going to keep those stable macroeconomic policies of our competitors. And you see parties on the right saying, yes, we're on the right, but we want to keep some of those social policies of our competitors quite different from what we've seen in the United States, for example. But that's not true everywhere. There are a number of countries that have moved to what we might call the hard left. Uh, certainly Venezuela would be the classic example. And there are a number of countries that are sort of aligning themselves with Venezuela on this issue, and that's become a huge controversy overall. Uh, let me start with uh, um, uh, Chile, outgoing president, Ms. Michelle Bachelet. A uh, very popular president. She's uh, been in since uh, 2006. Uh, she's now uh, le leaving uh, office. Quite a, a, a pedigree, a pediatrician, epidemiologist who had studied military strategy, was actually a defense uh, minister, uh, separated mother of three, an agnostic who speaks uh, Spanish, English, German, Portuguese, and French. Quite a formidable uh, uh, a person and with approval ratings that are really rather... Spectacular. That's her approval rating uh, as of January 2010. And that's running on the order of about 80% or so. You can see she had some rocky times earlier in her presidency. And there are a few times when the disapproval ratings actually went above uh, the approval ratings. And this was especially between 2006, 2007, where there was some pretty severe uh, student protests in Chile. Uh, and he was telling a sign saying, uh, do I have to sell a kidney to afford my education? Uh, and the like. What brought this on was actually Chile's economic success. If you remember 2006, 2007, copper prices were skyrocketing uh, with Chinese demand and the heated up global economy. And Chile is the Saudi Arabia of copper, if you will. And students and others on the left were really looking to Michelle Bachelet, who's a, a uh, Definitely a politician of the left, Social Democratic Party. Uh, looking forward to taking a lot of that money that was pouring into Chile and spread it on education and public uh, measures. And she was 
quite determined not to do this. Her view and the view of others in her uh, administration was that if we were to just take this as a windfall and spend it, what's going to happen when copper prices drop down? We're going to get caught in a trap. We're going to get in the, uh, the resource curse, as it's sometimes called, where countries will spend wildly when a resource that they have is selling at a high price, and then when the price drops down, they're in trouble. And also spending wildly could result in an inflated currency, something economists call the Dutch disease that happened in the Netherlands in the 19th. 50s when high natural gas prices started to overinflated currency. So her basic claim is, no, we're going to bank these extra reserves. We're going to keep them out of the economy. And that's sort of, a, in a way, a, a, a conservative economic line. You might say it was a cautious economic line. Uh, and most people would say that, in general, it was quite a successful uh, 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 policy. So anyway, her term is up, and we have a... Uh, uh, a voting system where you have two rounds, as in many countries, and if no one gets over 50%, you have a second round. So in December, you had the first round, and basically you had the left divided into three parties, uh, for three candidates, I should say. And one reason was because there are plenty of people on the Chilean left who thought that Michelle Bachelet and her party were too conservative. And so she had a, a challenger uh, from the Communist Party. Actually, he had not been a communist, but he join that party so he could compete. So there's a hard left uh, in Chile. That's 6% of the, uh, the vote. Uh, um, an independent who also uh, 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 came from a leftist background. His father had actually been the revolutionary left movement. He's a filmmaker, married to an important uh, TV hostess uh, known as uh, MEO, evidently, it's because his name is becoming too hard to uh, pronounce. Uh, French is his first language. Anyway, he got 20%. And then Eduardo uh, Frey, who had been, uh, again, from this uh, center-left coalition that's run Chile since 1989. Uh, he was a former president himself. His father had been a president. Uh, he got 30% of the vote. And the center-right candidate, uh, billionaire Sebastian Piñera, who had evidently introduced credit cards to Chile and uh, quite a financial genius. He got 44%. Uh, now, it looks like that that the three left candidates are uh, together way out polling the candidate on the right. Uh, but that's not how it worked out in the uh, second round. Well, first a little bit about uh, Pinera's campaign, uh, calling for, let's see, uh, you know, small enterprises, great opportunities. Uh, the classic sort of little bit populist line we need more economic growth, and small enterprises are going to do it. So we hear the same sort of rhetoric. And he also turned to worries about juvenile delinquency, which evidently was, uh, well, let's see, uh, you know, the delinquency you know, party is over. Uh, and evidently, there has been something of a surge of delinquency in uh, Chile. I'm not sure how big this is, but there's an NGO called Victims of Delinquency uh, to protect guys and inform victims of uh, violence. It looks like pretty serious violence. It doesn't seem like uh, juvenile delinquency to me when we're talking about this. Uh, but there is a real change in youth culture in Chile. Chile is, historically has been considered one of the most more culturally conservative Latin American countries. Uh, more role of the Catholic Church than in uh, some other Latin American countries and just sort of uh, more, more of a sense of, of, of restraint in the cultural system. But the new generation of Chilean youth are not nearly as restrained uh, as their parents were. And I think this is something that fed in. Uh, this is blocking us. Uh, kissing spree shocks uh, Chilean public. Uh, <laughs> Chilean teenagers have these, well, some of them anyway, uh, where they get, get together and try to kiss as many people as possible in their afternoon gatherings. <laughs> and I have talked to students, there's a, uh, San Fernando has a Santiago program, and uh, students have been saying, yes, the public display of affection in Chile is rather shocking, more than they had seen anywhere else. This is very much a new thing, it seems to me, and so I think this is probably something that's uh, upsetting some in the uh, uh, older generation. But at any right way, in the final round of the election, which just recently occurred, uh, Sebastian Piñera, the center-right candidate, won a, but not an overwhelming victory, 51% uh, of the vote to 48% for the center-left candidate, Eduardo Frey. But, you know, uh, uh, certainly a victory, no doubt about that. 
uh, interesting looking at the geography. I just it, Chile has a very nice set of regions because it just goes down the map one after another. So you can you can start in the north and you can end in the south and just do the numbers there. And I just took the map and uh, put in uh, blue for Pinera and uh, red for Frey. Uh, and put in a darker blue if you got over 55% uh, uh, of the vote and a very dark blue for over 60%. And the same with, uh, with Frey. And one thing you can see is a very regionally even election. They're much more even than the election in the United States. The last two elections of the United States we've seen much starker divide with one candidate and the other in 2008, uh, I think 15 states went over 60% for one or the other. And here we see very little of that. So in that sense, in a way, Chile is more nationally unified as an electoral body than the United States is. And this, I think it's a very good measurement to look at different countries. And you see a country like Ukraine, where one candidate will get 80%, 90% in some areas, and the other will get 80 or 90% in other areas. You know, that's a country that doesn't have a very strong sense of of cohesion or coherence. Uh, Chile uh, really does. Uh, just to give you a, a try to figure out some of the, the patterns here, I just took uh, the central, more densely populated part of uh, Chile right here. Uh, we can see the, uh, a lot of these uh, regions in the north went uh, more strongly for, uh, for Frey, the candidate on the left. These are the big mining uh, areas. Copper mines, other sort of mines, uh, unionized mining uh, labor force, so they're more strongly identified uh, with the left. Uh, that's not uh, surprising. Uh, Concepcion, that's a, a major industrial city, uh, and that went uh, for Frey as well. Uh, Valdivia, that's the center of the Germans, German settlement in Chile, and I'm not sure if that really has a lot to do with it or not. Uh, Santiago mixed, and uh, it depends really on what part of Santiago. About half of Chile's population is in Greater Santiago, uh, and, and some of the poor areas basically went for Frey, and the uh, wealthier areas for Piñera. Valparaiso, another big city, that went for uh, Piñera. Uh, the most interesting pattern here for me was the uh, the Mapuche Indian uh, area. Uh, Chile has about uh, the Mapuche, the indigenous uh, inhabitants of Central Chile. They probably put up more resistance to the Spaniards than any other group in the Americas. It was hundreds, for hundreds of years, the, uh, the border of Spanish settlement was about there, uh, or on this map, uh, right about there, there was the river Bio Bio. Beyond that was the Mapuche land, in the Araucania region. And the Spanish, until the late 1800s, could not conquer the Mapuche. And they finally did, and there was a lot of settlement, uh, but this area here is, is, is very heavily uh, Mapuche. And interestingly enough, they vote uh, conservative. Uh, and I, I don't know if other indigenous people <coughs> have that kind of conservative race. Have you got a picture of that? Well, I was going to mention something else. The Bachelet, uh, last month, uh, two months ago, actually made a formal apology oh. on behalf of the government to the Mapuche people. <laughs> In fact, there were, there were Mapuches who were at the Centre Europe sort of demonstration of what a There have been a lot of land issues, uh, land rights issues, uh, and so even though the outgoing party is on the center left, they've had a lot of tensions with the Mapuche people. So that's probably why the Mapuche, although I don't, uh, I was not able to find out uh, uh, if the incoming uh, conservative can, uh, the, the incoming uh, uh, president is uh, uh, appeal to them. I'm not sure. Uh, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, areas in the in the uh, in the far south uh, went pretty heavily for Pinar, and again there are issues here with uh, logging, hydroelectric dams, and these sort of development projects that have a lot of local opposition, and that has uh, partly uh, provoked some of the opposition to the outgoing government. So I don't know how much of it is in favor of Pinar and how much of sort of opposition to the government that had been in place. But there are. Probably not going to be huge changes uh, in in, uh, in Chile with this uh, coming election. A few things to understand about the Chilean economy uh, is just showing uh, economic growth rates. Uh, 
from uh, 1971 up to 2007. So we can see uh, blue is for all of South America and the brown line is for Chile. We can see a big economic crisis in the early 1970s. That's when a democratically elected Marxist uh, ruler, Salvador Allende, was in power. There was hyperinflation. There was a lot of capital flight. There was a lot of economic difficulties. And he was uh, ultimately thrown out in a military coup, which uh, most experts say had strong US backing. And that uh, led to then a military regime, which was quite brutal. But that regime did enact economic policies that many people think ultimately did lead to economic growth. Uh, although you can see the economic growth was uneven. Uh, Chile boomed in the late 70s, and it had a major recession in 1982. This was the Latin American debt crisis era, a lot of capital flight problems with inflation as well. But then it recovered in 1982. 89, democracy returned, and the center left came in power and has been in power ever since, up till now. And you can see that's really when Chile had this decade of really significant economic growth. You can see uh, growth between 5 and 10 percent a year for uh, over a decade. Uh, really boom time in Chile, uh, sort of propelling Chile above uh, Argentina, a kind of shock to the Argentines of like a down at the Chilean. Uh, Export-oriented growth uh, based on uh, fairly conservative, um, uh, fairly mainstream economic uh, policies uh, to try to keep uh, relatively low debt, uh, keep uh, the economy balanced, and focus a lot on exports. And so we see you know, uh, creating the Chilean wines, the Chilean off-season fruits, start flooding into our markets, really changing the dietary habits of Americans. And you remember when you couldn't get grapes except in uh, one summer and fall. Now they're there all year, thanks to uh, uh, the Chileans. We can see that once you get into uh, about 2000, Chilean growth is no longer extraordinary. It continues to grow, but not at the same pace uh, as it had. Or here's just another way of looking at it from 1945 up to 2000. And again, we have Chile in blue and South America as a whole in brown. And you can just see this uh, divergence that comes. It's just two very different pathways of Chile doing very well, rest of Latin America not doing so well. Uh, Chile has had problems with unequal distribution of wealth. That's what the Gini coefficient measures. It's a statistical tool that looks at the distribution of wealth in a population. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's at 1 or 100, that means one person has everything and no one else has anything. And if it's at uh, 0, that means everyone has exactly the same amount of wealth. Uh, what this shows, it's showing, it's interesting, Brazil always used to have the highest Gini coefficient in the world. Like, that's not true anymore. Uh, Bolivia now does, according to uh, recent data, but Chile quite high. You can see higher than Argentina, definitely higher than Uruguay or Colombia or Nicaragua. To the extent that we can trust these numbers, I'm always a little bit suspicious of some of these. So that is one of the things that this center-left par uh, party has been trying to do, is to try to address poverty, to try to bring the benefits of economic growth to a broader segment of the population. And it's been quite successful. So here's just poverty rate. Uh, you can see all of Latin America here, poverty rate coming down from you know, 48 to 38 or so, so that's a little bit. But in Chile, from about 38 down to about 12 or 13 percent. And so a lot of people have really credited the center left then for um, enacting policies that would help uh, the poor. So you get this interesting thing where the, the center left is saying, you know, uh, we don't want to get rid of those economic policies of the center right, and the center right is saying we don't want to get rid of those social policies of the center left. So it really is, or it seems to me, quite a, a sort of a coming together. And you can see Chile's a tr very uh, favorable trade balance. We have exports in blue, we have imports uh, in brown there, and that's the to total uh, balance, trade balance, very much in the positive quite different from most of Latin America. This is more of what you'd see in East Asia, more like an East Asian uh, pattern. So you know, very, very distinctive issues here.
And again, if anyone has questions or comments, and uh, I know some of you have uh, spent time in this part of the world and probably know quite a bit more about it than I do, so please jump in. Let me ask a question. What is the U.S. poverty rate? Total poverty rate in the United States. You know, different countries calculate poverty rate at a different level, depending on sort of how rich they are. Total U.S. poverty rate is probably pretty comparable. Does anybody know? Uh, something on the order of 10, 12 percent, I would think. I would have to, to check that. But poverty rate in the U.S. would be set at a higher level than it would in Chile. Yeah, Chile's done very well, but it's not up to sort of U.S. Uh, standards. Uh, well, Bolivia, next door, very, very different story just about every way you look at it. Uh, here we have uh, Evo Morales, who is the current president, who was just re-elected resoundingly against Ma Manfredo uh, Reyes Villa, our former mayor of the city of Cochabamba, right there, who was trapped in this election. Uh, what I did here is just took the most recent map showing vote percentages. I added some linguistic uh, information. The A here are areas where most people do not speak Spanish as their first language. They would speak Spanish, but as a second language. Most people there speak Aymara, an American Indian language. And most people here speak Quechua, which was the language of the Incan Empire, another Amerindian language. Bolivia has an indigenous majority. 55% uh, or so speak either Quechua or Aymara as their first language. Uh, most of them will be bilingual to some degree in Spanish, uh, but not all of them. Uh, in the north uh, and in the east, these are Spanish-speaking areas. Most of the population is mestizo, mixed European and Indian uh, descent. But they really are considered di different populations. And Bolivia, of course, has been dominated all along by the Spanish-speaking population, and particularly by a fairly narrow elite of, of European background. Uh, that came to a change uh, four years ago, where Evo Morales, full-blooded Aymara Indian, former labor uh, leader for coca pickers, so picking coca leaves, from which cocaine is made, but in Bolivia, a lot of legal products are made. Coca teas, coca for chewing. And if it's chewed as a leaf or eaten as a tea, it's a very mild uh, substance. It's something like uh, cocaine, more like uh, coffee or uh, something on that order. Uh, something that the uh, anti-drug efforts have targeted. The U.S. has certainly targeted. Previous administrations targeted because a lot of it is processed into cocaine. And Morales rose up from this indigenous community uh, and became president, and now is extraordinarily popular, well, certainly in the Aymara-speaking communities. I mean, look at that. Most of these areas in the Aymara, and even in the Quechua-speaking zone, over 90% of the vote. Overwhelming uh, victory. Whereas uh, uh, the eastern part of the country is a very different story. And actually, it's, it's good to compare these two maps. So you can see the southwest is highlands. It's the plateau, uh, the uh, elevated area, temperate climate. And then the north and the east is the lowlands, hot and uh, uh, humid in most areas. And traditionally, all the people and all the uh, um, economic activity was in the highlands. That's where the big mines were. That, that was where the large populations were. When the Spanish first got there, that's where they empire uh, had been in earlier empires. And the lowlands were fairly un uh, relatively unpopulated, but there's been a huge movement over the last 20, 30 years. These, many of these areas are being opened up for agribusiness. Uh, same thing is happening across the border in Brazil in even a bigger way. Brazil has just seen this tremendous explosion of agriculture in the central part of the country. A lot of it is uh, actually new agricultural techniques. A lot of these soils aren't very good, and for a long time they just weren't productive. But now they know the right kind of fertilizers. They need to get trace minerals in there. Uh, it was mostly the Brazilians who did the research to figure out how to make these tropical soils productive. But once you do that, they're very productive. So this is a booming agro-business area. Uh, Santa Cruz, which I've outlined here, is uh, a city of a couple million. That's the center of this zone. It's Spanish-speaking. It prides itself as being non-indigenous, different from the highlands. Uh, and uh, in many, especially the areas along the Brazilian border where the economy is oriented towards Brazil, not towards the highlands of Bolivia, uh, there uh, Morales is not at all popular. 
Uh, so much so that a few years ago, there was a real, uh, well, it still is an, an autonomy movement, a movement to separate the East, if not make it a separate country, at least make it so autonomous that they, that they keep their own taxes and that they keep their own administrative system and basically to, to split the country uh, almost uh, in half. Uh, that's died down a little bit, partly because Morales is so popular. A uh, few other things I'll note, uh, there's the city of Taria uh, uh, here, which is the center of the natural gas industry. Morales did not win that, partly because he nationalized natural gas, and he's also refused to sell natural gas to Chile, and there are a few other issues, so he uh, lost there. He lost in uh, the city of Sucre. Uh, Bolivia's industry has two capitals, La Paz and Sucre. Sucre is the constitutional capital, but it's a Spanish-speaking city and it's sort of surrounded by more indigenous parts of, of, the, of the country. Even in a lot of the lowland areas, though, the vote went for Morales. And partly that's because uh, Highlanders are moving into the lowlands. So Quechua and Aymara speakers themselves are moving down into the lowlands as well. So that split between the Spanish-speaking lowlands and the indigenous highlands isn't as clear uh, cut as it used to be. Uh, the election, actually, this was the election in 2005. It was sort of even more geographically clear-cut, where practically all of the east and the north went for the uh, opponent, and uh, Morales uh, won very few uh, areas here. And I should say that, um, uh, well, a little bit about Morales himself. He is quite far to the left. He's really allied himself with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Uh, you know, here he is, the worst enemy of humanity is U.S. capitalism. And that's what provokes uprisings like our own, a rebellion against the system, uh, representation of savage capitalism. So, you know, pretty strong left, leftist uh, rhetoric against the ideology of socialism, left-wing nationalism, anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism, and Bolivarianism. That's the code word of Hugo Chavez. He claims that what he's creating is a Bolivarian alternative for the Americans. Harkening back to Simon uh, Bolivar, and many people would say sort of twisting Bolivar's uh, actual uh, uh, message. Uh, so fairly strong. Uh, his competitor in the election, Manfredo uh, uh, Reyes uh, Vila, very opposite sort of uh, uh, individual, <laughs> made money selling real estate, uh, ran a nightclub called Hollywood and successful with a successful Bolivian Hawaiian nightclub impresario. <laughs> owned a nightclub called the Pink Cadillac. Financial success after selling real estate in the U.S. Quite the operator, and like I say, he was mayor of the Highland city of Cochabamba, uh, which is it's Highlands, but it's mixed Spanish and Quechua speaking. Uh, it's uh, it's, a, it's more commercially oriented than a lot of the areas of the Highlands. But in 2007, it was, uh, it was bloodshed between uh, Villa, uh, uh, Reyes Villa's supporters and Morales' supporters. Uh, lots of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of fighting. You can see Morales uh, blame the bloodshed on Reyes Villa, accusing him of supporting separatism, wanting to break off these non-indigenous areas, violating human rights. Uh, and then Morales wanted to uh, remove Reyes Vila from office. He said he would not resign. So anyway, and then he went on to say that Morales is creating a totalitarian regime. So these two individuals really uh, tussling. Uh, I did a post on this on my blog, and I got an, an email from a friend. I wish she had posted it on the blog uh, itself, but she sent me an email saying, what do you have to understand is my friend Reyes Vila was really a corrupt person. And the Bolivians knew this. That he had all kinds of shady underworld dealings and connections with sort of uh, underworld people in the United States. And he, as soon as the election was over, he fled the U.S. And she said, that's, that's really one of the things that's going on here as well. But certainly, Evo Morales, well cemented in power now. Oh, just to give you a few maps of population distribution, this was from 67. And you can see the, the darker areas are more densely populated. And you can see it's all in the highlands from La Paz down through Cochabamba and Sucre. A little bit in Santa Cruz, the rest of the lowlands uh, very unpopulated. And here's the only more recent map I can find. And you can just see how much more even the population distribution is now as people have been moving down into these uh, new lowland tropical uh, agricultural zones.
So a few years ago, I was wondering if uh, Bolivia really might break up. Uh, that may happen, but the sort of overwhelming victory that Morales had would, would uh, argue against that. Population growth, just to show you how relatively lightly populated Bolivia is, only 3 million in 61, and it's up around 9 million today. So you can see pretty steady growth, but it still is not a tremendously populated country. And just to give you the fertility rate, which was about 7 in 1960, the average woman having 7 children is now 3.5. By Latin American standards, that's very high. Most of Latin America is, is coming into population stability. Bolivia is still growing quite a bit but not to the extent that it used to be. Uh, and then just a few lines about Bolivia and Chile, because if you spend any time in either country, you know there's no love lost between them. Uh, the Bolivians especially have a very, uh, uh, a lot of anger about Chile. It goes back to the War of the Pacific in the 1870s. One thing you can see on this map is how much territory Bolivia has lost to other countries. These areas lost to Brazil. This area lost to Brazil. Even Paraguay took a uh, large area in the 1930s. But it's that zone right there that is the crucial issue because Bolivia had an outlet to the sea, an outlet to the sea now in northern Chile that has lots of mineral resources as well. And so the Bolivians have never forgotten that. And there's this real this sort of deep-seated animosity that the Chileans stole our outlet to the sea, locked us in the interior of this continent and deprived us of all of these resources. So Bolivia could certainly be making quite a bit of money selling natural gas, for example, to Chile, but that doesn't happen because of these uh, deep animosities. So in a way, it's no surprise that Bolivia and Chile would be going different directions. They are very, very different uh, countries. Let me just pause for a second and see if uh, anyone has comments or yes. Are the Chileans nasty or is, <laughs> no, I, I'm saying is do they allow full traffic to the sea or oh. are there major barriers which Bolivia intrudes the sea? It's a great question. The Chileans have, have uh, offered a negotiating position. They said we will allow you full access. You could build railways, express lines, you could have port facilities uh, and the like. So at least that's my understanding. Does anyone, does anyone know more about this than I do? But the Bolivians have not, my understanding is that Bolivia has been reluctant to do well, that. There was a lot of passing in the breeze involved in, in that. It is now. Yeah. So it wasn't a good deal for the Bolivians? No, I don't think it was a good deal for the Bolivians. They, they lost the tuition. Essentially, that territory that Chile took, yeah. uh, the British wanted to have some exclusive rights when it belonged to Bolivia. Bolivia thought it belonged to them. Chile wanted it. England said, well, we'll support you in the war. And so with the naval power, it was, it was never really necessary. Right. Um, they, they took that. And that, in fact, Bolivia and Peru were, were on one side. Yeah, this was Peruvian territory. Peruvian territory. Yeah, they actually took that. So it was a critical war. But it was just... And that's playing the British card, which is not going to go down well in most of Latin America, because Britain was really seen as a, uh, a dominating, economically dominating power in, in much of the 1800s uh, in, in many parts of Latin America. Yes? Did the Catholic Church get involved in these elections? Or do they uh, traditionally <laughs> side with more conservative or more uh, liberal? Well, not on the surface. Uh, traditionally, though, they have been a sort of a, a bulwark of the, of the conservative groups, although there is a movement, um, a leftist Catholic movement back from the 60s and 70s called uh, Liberation Theology. And we'll see later that there are a number of countries, well, Paraguay is a classic case where a, a former uh, priest, or actually, is he a bishop, Lucas? Uh, he was a bishop, yeah, uh, who is now president, and he's, he's uh, center left. Well, how far left remains to be seen. Yeah, there is a little bit. It was sort of almost like a Jesuit colony. Oh, Paraguay, absolutely. The Jesuits totally, it was a theocracy. They ran it. Now, I'll talk about that a, a little more. But uh, I have a lot of other uh, other examples. So let me let me just talk just more generally about this this transformation of Latin American politics. So what I did, I went back to 1978, uh, and I have put here in purple countries that were under military dictatorship. 
Now, Paraguay is not because it was not a military dictatorship, but it was a dictatorship. It was a dictatorship of the Colorado Party, and uh, 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 um, but it was not a military dictatorship. Dictatorship, strictly speaking. So Guatemala and Honduras and Nicaragua and Panama and Ecuador and Brazil and Peru and Bolivia and Chile and Argentina and Uruguay, all under military dictatorship at this time. Uh, as far as countries that had multi-party democracies, we had Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and Colombia. And of those, the two that had stable democracies, only two had stable democracies at this time, which would have been Costa Rica, which is, you know, always had a stable democracy, and Venezuela at that time. Uh, Venezuela had quite a democratic tradition. Colombia, very different story. Yeah, you had democracy, but the uh, groups known as the liberals and conservatives, not quite what we would call liberals and conservatives, perhaps, were often at war with each other. I mean, literally. Uh, uh, periods where there was just intense fighting and bloodshed. So you could say that Colombia had a democracy, but no, not as stable democracy by any means, nor was Dominican Republic a stable democracy. So really, at this point, there was little. Chile had had a, a long democratic history until 1973, when Allende was overthrown and Pinochet came to power. So, so Chile was, uh, if we'd gone back earlier, if we'd gone back 10 years earlier, Chile would have been one of the few stable democratic republics. And it's an interesting question to try to figure out why this is. The best theory I've heard about Costa Rica is that uh, Costa Rican agriculture was based on uh, smallholder coffee. Uh, so rather than big plantations, you had small family farms, family labor, and that led to a more even distribution of power and hence uh, sort of a democratic uh, background. And that's probably somewhat simplistic, but if you could say to contrast it with some of its neighbors that had more of these you know, big plantations or so costly ended systems, that led to uh, less democratic governance. <coughs> or so it's often, it's often portrayed uh, like so. Uh, 1970s uh, and into the 1980s, were a period of economic turmoil in Latin America. And this is something that sort of helped discredit military and other sorts of dictatorship. Uh, although some of these problems occurred in, uh, not just in the uh, military dictatorship. But one was a hyperinflation. Uh, we're talking about Argentina <coughs> first. Uh, let's see, we could, the overall impact of hyperinflation was one, 1992 peso was equal to, what is that, 100 billion? Pre 1983 pesos. Uh, I don't have the numbers right. Or in Brazil, with a real currency until 1942, one current real equivalent of, I don't even know what that number is. Uh, so I, up until Zimbabwe showed the, how, how high inflation could possibly go, uh, Latin America, uh, as, law, uh, law, as well as Germany in the 1920s, was these classic cases of hyperinflation. Inflation rates so high that uh, prices would go up hourly, that if you got any money, you had to spend it immediately. And that meant wealthy people who had ways of hedging their sort of bets and uh, could buy ways of getting around inflation were okay, but the middle class was just devastated by this. So this was something that, like I say, uh, helped discredit the, uh, the uh, some of these military regimes. Also, we see average annual economic growth percent by decades, 68 uh, 2000. Uh, red is Latin America. Uh, we have the United States here. Uh, let's see, East Asia in blue, Western Europe in brown, United States in black. And you can see the lagging growth of Latin America well, well below East Asia, but below other areas as well. And there was a big debt crisis at this time. Latin American countries borrowed. Uh, massive amounts of money. Uh, this is in the 70s, what something called recycled petrodollars. So oil prices went way up, money goes into Middle Eastern countries, Latin American countries borrow that money, but then there was a balance of payment crisis, and it was not a, a very um, um, efficient uh, system. Uh, what that led to was a um, big movement for democratization. And there were other reasons for that. I don't want to say it was just an economic issue. There were larger pressures. 
But today, <laughs> if we want to find non-multi-party democracies, we have Cuba, which is uh, uh, certainly nothing like a democracy. In Honduras, I'm putting a question mark on it. Honduras had a military coup, but then they had another election just recently. The, uh, the left boycotted that election. I'll show you maps. So Honduras is kind of shaky, but everywhere else we have multi-party democracies of one form or another. Now, Venezuela, I probably should have put a question mark there as well, because the democratic system is being dismantled. You know, <coughs> Venezuela still has elections, it's still going to have more elections, but the opposition gets no media time. Uh, I'll give you some examples of that uh, uh, later on. Now, one question is how strong are these democracies? It's one thing to say you have a multi-party democracy. It's another thing to actually have a well-functioning democracy. And The Economist magazine, interestingly enough, has a democracy index looking at electoral process, pluralism, civil liberties, functioning of government, political participation. I assume the United States is not in the highest category because we have relatively low levels of voting. I mean, there might be some other issues. But we have Sweden here as the most democratic country and North Korea as the least. And you can see Latin America is sort of in the middle. Costa Rica, Uruguay, Chile, Brazil, interestingly enough, shown with very high levels. The colors are hard to see on this, but actually we have uh, uh, Venezuela in a much darker shade of blue. Ecuador is in a darker shade of blue as well. So some of these democratic countries are not as solidly or stably democratic uh, as others. A lot of public opinion polling in Latin America to see what people think of this democratization movement. So here we have, there's something called the La, uh, Latino uh, Berometro, uh, Latin American barometer uh, polling firm. So democracy is preferable to any other type of government. I don't know if you can see these, but in most countries it's at pretty high levels, not maybe as high as you'd get in Europe. And uh, some of the poorer countries like Guatemala, it's still less than 50%, it's 42%. Uh, interestingly, in Venezuela, it's very high, 82%. But the numbers have gone up in most of these countries. So not only has there been this democratization movement, but it's, it's sort of broadly supported. More and more people in Latin America are saying, yes, democracy is the way to go. But there are uh, exceptions. Or here's just another way of looking at some of the same data. Are you satisfied with the way democracy is working? And we have a circle for 96, 2001, and 2008. Uh, I'm sort of staggered that Venezuela shows it as high as it does. But that's, well, that's about 50%, but it's actually showing it's increased. But Uruguay, very high. Uh, a lot of countries, though, not very satisfied. Peru, Paraguay, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, <coughs> Bolivia, even Argentina. A lot of people aren't too satisfied. Yeah, and supporters of Chavez are, you know, think that they live in a democracy. Yeah. And there are they can really you know, go after the states and say, yeah, we live in a democracy. Yeah, but he had votes. votes. So I can totally understand why yeah. that's, that's shifting that way. Because Chavez, he did win the election um, with very quite broad to some extent, but it wasn't, the opposition accepted his speech yeah. very easily. Yeah, and so, international observers have claimed that that election was valid. Election. I could just totally see why that's yeah. moving to the right because Chavez supporters are saying, yeah, we live in democracy. The opposition, of course, is just saying, you know, we want a democracy. <laughs> so that 84 number that right. you showed in the previous one, which yeah. is higher than any other Latin American country, yeah. is because the opposition and the supporters are saying, yeah, we want oh, democracy. <laughs> and we live in democracy, and yeah, we're living it, and we want it. And so I see that. Uh, that thank you. Yeah, so very different definitions of what democracy is. Fascinating. Thank you for thanks for the clarification. I, I do appreciate it. Or actually, I thought this was pretty interesting. Which is basically, do you think your uh, democracy functions better than in the rest of Latin America? You can see the Chileans, the Uruguayans, Costa Ricans, Costa Ricans. Many of them are saying yes. We are the democratic countries, unlike the rest of uh, Latin America. Whereas Peru, Honduras, El Salvador, not many people are saying that. Again, uh, Venezuela fairly high which is uh, uh, intriguing. Uh, it's one thing to look at uh, how governments actually function. It's another to look at how they're supposed to function or, or how they're supposed to be organized. And the almost, I've, uh, very rare map 
uh, this actually it's a, it's a Wikipedia map, and I've never seen a map like this before. But it's showing not, it says that the de, de, de jure, or in other words, sort of the legal form of government. And what they're showing here in blue is uh, presidential republics, like the United States, and essentially all of Latin America except Cuba. So by presidential republic, we mean uh, uh, a, a democratic system with elections with a strong president who is elected directly, rather than a parliamentary system. Uh, and you can see in Europe, you have, you have parliamentary constitutional monarchies and par parliamentary republics and parliamentary and semi-presidential republics. That would be like France, where you have a prime minister and a president uh, and the like. But the reason I showed this is just how uh, Latin American countries essentially all have on paper the same form of government, except uh, Cuba, which is uh, classified here as a, what do they have, a single party republic, the Communist Party, as in China, as in North Korea, as in <coughs> Vietnam, as in Laos. Uh, Syria and Turkmenistan, they have single party parties. It's not the Communist Party, it's the Ba'ath Party in Syria. I don't know what they call it in, the, in Turkmenistan. But the same sort of on paper political systems here uh, as in the United States. Now, what about this uh, turn to the left? And to understand this, you have to, again, go back to hyperinflation. And lagging economic growth in the 70s and 80s, and that's considered sort of lost decades in Latin America. Uh, and then you had Chile as the star economic performer, the exception to this Latin American uh, stagnation in this period. This led many to what was known as the uh, uh, movement towards neoliberalism, which can be a very confusing term because it's liberalism in the old sense of liberalism, meaning free markets, minimal government interference open capitalism, open exports, reduce trade barriers. So under the military dictatorships and, uh, and earlier, much of Latin America had economic policies based on what's called uh, uh, import substitution industrialization. In other words, put up big trade barriers so you're not getting those manufactured products from uh, the wealthy countries, and then you're going to build up your own manufacturing platform within your country. And these works. A lot of people would say that that import substitution model worked pretty well in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but by the 70s, <coughs> it was not working anymore. It was the export-oriented countries. First Japan, and then Taiwan, and South Korea, and Singapore, and Malaysia, and then Chile and Latin America. It was the export uh, countries that were doing much better economically. So there was this big movement pushed by the United States, pushed by the World Bank, pushed by the IMF, for what are known as neoliberal policies. Uh, reduce trade barriers, privatize state-owned firms, bring in private capital, encourage uh, uh, exports, uh, reduce subsidies, and so on. And not all Latin American countries sort of went this way, but many of them did, uh, sort of Chile being the first, we could say. But it didn't work out very well in a lot of other countries. They didn't, weren't able to, to uh, replicate what Chile had done. In many places, uh, it's sort of hard to say why, but in Bolivia, for example, uh, it resulted in lots of social unrest. You had water services being privatized, for example. The idea was that poor delivery of water, private firms are going to have an economic <coughs> incentive to build better water delivery facilities, but what happened was European, often European companies or companies from elsewhere in South America moved in, bought the Bolivian water system, and uh, really raised the price of water and infuriated local people. Uh, so in many areas, there was then, by 2000, a real movement against this neoliberal consensus. So we can see just some book titles. Beyond neoliberalism, after neoliberalism, after the neoliberal debacle, uh, and so on. So this led then to, along with the uh, spread of democracy then, people voting in more left-leaning governments, moving away from this conservative neoliberal economic system, if you will. And by 2007, for a map from The Economist, they're mapping countries as either left-leaning here in uh, this sort of uh, pinkish color or center-right. And all we had at this time was Mexico, 
uh, Honduras. Why do we have Costa Rica? That's they shouldn't have had Costa Rica uh, and Colombia. Uh, I've done my own. Uh, oh, uh, I think that's a bit misleading, though. Because what, what do we mean, left leaning? We really want to put uh, Venezuela in the same category as Chile. I don't think so. I think those are very different ways of, of, of being on the left. Chile, center left. Uh, Venezuela, uh, uh, far left. And the crucial thing to find out here is uh, this organization uh, <coughs> is called uh, uh, ALBA. But that means Don in Spanish, but it's also an acronym for the, the Alliance, the Bolivarian the Bolivarian Alliance for the People of Our America. This is Hugo Chavez's uh, geopolitical uh, framework that he created. The one that you know, really sees the United States as the enemy, global capitalism as the enemy, a need for Latin Americans to expel uh, U.S. interests uh, and create a kind of a socialist system. Uh, Bolivia with Evo Morales uh, 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 joined in, Ecuador with uh, uh, Correa joined in, uh, Cuba, no surprise, with uh, uh, the Castros, Nicaragua with Daniel Ortega, Honduras was in there, but let's take Honduras out, because once the coup happened last fall, uh, Honduras is out of that uh, uh, category. Oh, also some Caribbean islands, uh, Dominica, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Antigua and Barbuda, but very, very small countries that are in it. So what I try to do here was to, to make my own map of, of sort of political flavor, if you will, of Latin American countries. And so I have left, if we will, you know, and this whole left-right divide, we use it so often, but it's really a pretty simplistic notion, really, to think there's a one-dimensional uh, continuum, right? We can put everybody in a place on this continuum. You know, it's much more complicated than that. But for the sake of argument, let's pretend there is this situation. So Cuba, I put in deep dark red for being uh, really the only remaining communist country, I, I think you could say today. Uh, and in fact, in the last couple of years, they've been moving even more in that direction. There were some market initiatives that uh, Castro was allowing that are really being shut down right now. So we could pretty much put that... Uh, yeah, a communist country. And then Nicaragua, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia, uh, countries that are uh, still have some aspects of democratic governance, uh, still more plural societies than Cuba, but definitely in the anti-US, anti-capitalist uh, camp. Uh, Venezuela more so than the others. Then in this lighter pink, we could call up uh, countries of the, of the center left where you have governments that uh, uh, accept uh, the global capitalist system, that want to work with it rather than against it, that want stable economic policies, but also want to address the needs of the poor, to try to redistribute wealth a little bit, and to try to create sort of broader social framework. So Chile would have been in that category until this election, but that's certainly, certainly Brazil uh, would fall into it. Costa Rica, a few other countries. So let's do some of these countries on a, on a case by case basis. And then what we might call the center right countries, where again you have, you don't have any countries on the far right anymore. Uh, it wasn't long ago, all those military dictatorships, you would put them all on the far right, essentially. But now the far right is, uh, pretty much has no power, and you have countries with center right Mexico, now Honduras again, with this new election, Panama. Uh, Colombia and Chile coming in, so it's uh, it's a it's a it's a, a diverse system. Let me again uh, pause and take a drink and see if you have questions or comments. And if anyone wants to suggest any different categorization of any of these countries, uh, feel feel perfectly free to do so. Uh, yeah. Has Ortega been back to the politics levels at bottom? Has the world changed since? I, I'll, I'll, actually, I have some slides on Nicaragua and Daniel Ortega, so I'll, I'll come to him in a little bit. So let's, what, what I want to do now is just sort of to run through a lot of these uh, countries. I'll start with Venezuela, since Hugo Chavez is the, uh, the controversial figure in Latin America, uh, to be sure. Uh, so you just see political party, United Socialist Party. I've got to give you a few of his uh, quotes. 
is that, uh, well, I lost the top of that quote anyway, uh, capitalism leads us straight to hell. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's pretty clear cut. He's not hedging his bets there. Or I could accuse the North American empire, that means the United States, of being the biggest menace to our planet. Of course, I didn't find the actual quote, but when I was at the UN and uh, George Bush had been in the room and he talked about the smell of sulfur lingering in the air. Uh, you know, Bush has the demonic uh, figure. Uh, anyway, right now, just from uh, this is just uh, yeah, from January 24th, 2010, uh, he's sort of heightening the screws, if you will. Uh, for a long time, the opposition has not been able to have broadcast television, but they at least had a cable television channel. But uh, he was forcing them to have to televise his talks, which evidently, I don't think he talks quite as long as Fidel Castro would, but he can go on and on. But he has this show, you know, Hello President, where he's on, he's on television all the time. He, he loves the media. He, he loves to be in the spotlight. So anyway, he's uh, uh, shut down a TV station, and there are big economic problems. One thing is his programs are very expensive. He spent lots of money on foreign affairs. They're trying to create this Bolivarian alternative. That's expensive. And big economic programs to, uh, to try to reach out to the poor population in maybe some not very economically sensible ways. But again, it costs a lot of money. He spent a lot of money on He purchased massive numbers of, uh, of small arms and of, uh, and of larger arms, right, from uh, from uh, Eastern uh, Europe, I believe. Uh, at one point, he said he had to arm everybody because an American invasion was imminent. So, uh, so yes, good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, there's problems now with electricity. Uh, the electricity, uh, uh, there's no, he's taking over. Uh, uh, here's a supermarket chain run by a French retailer. He's taking over a lot of uh, oil uh, uh, interests uh, run by foreign companies. And yes, Venezuela has a tremendous amount of oil, but um, a lot of their oil deposits are, are difficult to, uh, to get at. It's heavy oil, it's thick oil, it needs a lot of refining, and it needs a lot of capital and a lot of expertise. And a lot of people think that he's really jeopardizing Venezuela's economic future by expropriating foreign firms that have that, some of that expertise. I, I have personal experience working at a major oil station. They're there for political reasons. They're there for political reasons. Um, certainly some people just don't give the political opinion how much they vary from the oil because they're not going to go try it. But right. Most of the uh, most of the most of the Panda Basin is in the in the in the Kevin, you know, Venezuela had real close connections with the US yeah. in earlier periods. And that, that's one thing, I mean this is such a, a divergence from what had been the norm for so long. English proficiency, uh, Venezuela had the highest level of English proficiency of any Latin American country except for Brazil. Yeah. And it's been primarily because of that Venezuela relationship. A lot of back and forth with right. Venezuela, primarily South Florida. Um, but well, now you're seeing a lot of Venezuelans leave Venezuela and go to the United States. So, so, so many of them are being uh, forced out. Uh, let's look at, I think, yeah, we come up with some uh, maps. Uh, here's one. Here's a, a presidential election 2006. So you can see uh, Chavez over 90 percent in large areas of the country. Uh, the only real exception is in the uh, Maracaibo area. That's the oil producing area, and some of the Andean region here, which is historically somewhat uh, marginalized from the rest. Uh, the uh, Caracas is uh, uh, over there, but uh, actually a better place we can see it is uh, the constitutional referendum of 2009. That was to allow uh, Chavez to continue, uh, to change the constitution so he could continue to maintain power rather than being kicked out by 
a term limit. Uh, and so, and again, this is a, a pretty fair election, most people think. Uh, uh, Caracas is right there in green. Uh, Miranda is uh, where a lot of the wealthier people uh, 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 live. Uh, so it's sort of suburban, or excuse, yeah, sort of suburban Caracas almost. But over here in the far west, this is the oil producing area. And not only oil, but it's, it has long been sort of the polar opposite of Caracas. In fact, uh, here I'll give you an, an, ex you know, an example that the Maracaibo, that's the Zulia, the Maracaibo area here. Uh, the culture is different. Actually, even the, uh, some of the linguistic uses are different. Different uh, dances and desserts and living and customs and everything. Even so different that in one, they drink Pepsi and the other, they drink Coke. So you know, <laughs> these are different areas. My, my company's also doing Which is, is, is the largest uh, Venezuelan beer company. Now we dominate a whole country except for Maracaibo. That's where we're right now. You're going to drink a different beer. Yeah, they, and they almost do it on purpose. No matter what they, they do in the rest, they're going to do something and different. The Medina, over here. the Medina thing has to do with the Colombian connection. There's a lot of Colombian uh, influence in obviously Colombia and Japan, and they can't catch up. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's very interesting because there's a tremendous amount of trade between Colombia and Venezuela, but most of that has been shut down. Uh, Venezuela, you know, Venezuela is an oil economy. They don't produce much else. It's a classic case of sort of oil driving out other economic activities. So uh, oil uh, and gasoline from Venezuela to Colombia, and then all sorts of things from Colombia to Venezuela. And yes, you have the Andean Mountains running right here, so Merida gets much more closely connected sort of physically and through this trade connection. I think people are very upset at those trade, that trade across that border being shut down. Yes? So you, you, you use the term, you know, classic case of oil driving out of ah. other economic activity. Right. I, I wouldn't think that would happen. I would think that oil would generate revenue, which would spur yeah. other economic development. Is that well, it, it, it can in, in countries that are already wealthy and well-run and democratic. So in... Norway, oil has not been a problem. In Texas, oil has not been a problem. Uh, okay, well, maybe. <laughs> well, Texas has led to a lot of backwards and forward linkages. I mean, it has led to, you know, Texas is a pretty uh, um, well, well off economy, we could say. But in uh, Nigeria, uh, many African countries, Equatorial Guinea and Gabon and Cameroon, even the Persian Gulf countries in, in Costa Rica. Everything comes to just depend on oil, and that jacks up the currency, and that drives out other activities. It also means that countries that have a lot of oil don't need to develop close relationships with their citizens. They don't need to actually tax people because they can just skim off the top, and then you'll get corrupt bureaucrats who are doing what economists would call rent-seeking, just trying to get as much of those goods for themselves rather than building up a, a broader economic base. And Venezuela really wasn't characterized so much by that. But, but um, there's a political scientist uh, here at Stanford named Terry Carl who's worked on this. He's got the book called The Resource Curse. So you know, actually, large levels of resources can be a curse <coughs> because it can so distort your economy and can lead to perverse incentives and, uh, and the like. Uh, but Venezuela in the 50s and 60s, I don't think really was like that. I think it was a pretty broad based economy. I think it was a little broader. Like broader. It was never. They never took that to the next level. Right. Really, the that was a, a sort of you know slingshot effect. All right, and, all, and so then what happens then is when oil prices drop down like they did in the '90s. I mean, how low did they go in the '90s? Where Chavez took over, it was nine dollars a barrel. Nine dollars a barrel. Okay, now at seventy-four, I think, or some something. But what happened was the oil went way up in the 70s, and then in the 80s, and especially in the 90s, it just plummeted. So Venezuela just had the rug pulled out from under it because everything was oil, and suddenly oil is really cheap. And uh, what had been a very middle-class country then ends up with, with a lot of, 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 of poverty, and that's what propelled Chavez into office. Uh, but anyway, this is it's still a wealthier part of the country in this you know, very oppositional sense. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, how about in Ecuador, another member of the Bolivarian Alternative, uh, Rafael Correa, who is a PhD in economics, 
but is by no means a mainstream economist. Uh, he uh, is sort of a left nationalist, you might say. It's interesting, this uh, uh, party that he founded, Proud and Sovereign Fatherland Alliance. You, know, you hear that, that sounds like something the far right would come up with, right? So it's a, it's a, a nationalist uh, leftist, but also Roman Catholic. So not standard Marxism by any means. Uh, so he calls himself a humanist, Christian of the left, proponent of socialism of the 21st century. And he did say at one point that uh, Chavez's comparison was unfair to the devil. Tell us what I mean about what I doesn't suggest that he's real, that he's that extreme. I don't think he's as extreme as Chavez or Edgar, as you have a sense of uh, In fact, a lot of people say he was elected because he was the devil. <laughs> Serious, it's not. Uh, it's, it's, uh, he was younger, he was more energetic. And again, uh, Ecuador being a sort of a poor country, mm -hmm. uh, you side with him. And uh, but, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of substance. Uh, Chavez is, uh, he's got a little more charisma, huh. a little more substance. Uh, I mean, he must be smart, right? He should be in economics. Not necessarily. Ah, what about Nicaragua? That was just brought up. Well, Daniel Ortega, you might remember him from the 1980s when he was the leader of the, the left-wing Marxist revolutionary organization called the Sandinistas and came to power in Nicaragua through uh, military means, uh, allied himself with the Soviet Union and with Cuba. Uh, the United States uh, subsidized a group of counter-revolutionaries, the Contras, Eventually, uh, Nicaragua solved its problem by holding an election, and the Sandinistas and Daniel Ortega were voted out of power. Uh, when was that? Late 80s? The elected Chamorro came in. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, uh, you know, he was uh, this revolutionary leftist leader and allowed election to take place. He lost and he stepped out of power. Then he reformulated himself. And the main thing he did was to go conservative on social issues, but not economic systems. So denounced his former Marxist stance, uh, became much more uh, became Catholic, and is now doing things like banning all abortions in Nicaragua. So he's on this this far left group. He's part of the Bolivarian Alternative, anti-U.S. anti-imperialist. I think I mentioned before Venezuela and Nicaragua are two. Are the only countries that are recognizing the independence of these breakaway pseudo states of, of, uh, of um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, but yet, on social issues, he's somewhat conservative. And there are a number of other politicians who are doing this. I think it's a, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe it's, it, it, it could be com completely legitimate, or maybe it's just his way of manipulating things and getting power, realizing that a lot of people in Nicaragua want leftist economic policies, redistributive policies and the like, but are also fairly conservative when it comes to social mores and religion. Uh, and so we've got this, this uh, Christian left, if you will. And so uh, Daniel Ortega would be representing that. Uh, Just to give you a sort of a GDP per capita map, the one thing I wanted to notice is a lot of the countries we've been talking about are some of the poorer countries. Uh, certainly Nicaragua, Honduras, Bolivia are poorest countries in Latin America. Uh, Ecuador is fairly poor as well. Now Venezuela isn't because Venezuela has the oil. You can see Chile and Argentina quite a bit wealthier. So I'm just, what I'm wondering now is, okay, let's look at some of these other poor countries and see where they've gone. Look at Paraguay, look at Peru, for example. Well, Peru doesn't come up here, but it probably should. Or another thing, areas where the first language of most people's homes is not Spanish. Uh, so in every country here, Spanish or Portuguese in the case of Brazil are the dominant national languages, but there are big areas where most people in home are speaking something else. I talked about the Mapuche area in Chile, or we have Aymara here in Quechua, and then a much larger Quechua area in Peru and up into Ecuador. Quechua was the language of the Incan Empire, and they spread it the same way the Romans spread Latin. The Incan spread Quechua. And then we have the various Mayan Indians and uh, languages in Guatemala. It shouldn't quite be that big. 
southern Mexico, other parts of southern Mexico, and then Guarani and, and Paraguay. So these are areas where uh, areas of this map. Most of the people within those areas, or at least many of them, map isn't quite perfectly accurate, but are speaking a non-Spanish language as their first language. So most of them bilingual. So let's look at some of these other countries. And a uh, fascinating case is Paraguay. So it's one of the poor countries. It is uh, actually it's a very interesting country in so many ways. One thing in Paraguay is always going to be the most bilingual country in the world. You know, in Bolivia, so yeah, the poor Indios, yeah, they speak Aymara and Quechua, but you're not going to find wealthy Spanish-speaking people speaking Aymara or Quechua. In Paraguay, on the other hand, virtually everybody speaks Spanish and virtually everybody speaks Guarani. Uh, so it's, it's almost total bilingual. The wealthy people, they speak Guarani too, and the poor people speak Spanish as well. And that goes back to its roots. Someone brought it up as a Jesuit theocracy. The Jesuits ran Paraguay for several hundred years as a theocratic government. Uh, they came up the Paraguay River. They established their base there. Uh, Guarani were a settled agricultural people, and the Jesuits were basically sort of ruling over them and created a very much a society apart, separate from the rest of Latin America. The Jesuits were eventually expelled late 1700s by the Spaniards. Paraguay becomes independent, but it takes a very different course. Uh, economically rather isolated until recently, politically very, very distinctive, and the episode that really sums this up is the War of the Triple Alliance in the 1870s when Paraguay took on Uruguay, okay, Spanish Fall Country, and Argentina, and Brazil. <laughs> Just imagine that. It was, from all the major wars, probably the most destructive to any given country. Supposedly, Paraguay ended that war with 90, 85 to 90% of its male population dead. Something like 28,000 men survived that war. It came close to winning, I mean, almost, because it was this highly organized, militarized society from this sort of bizarre, theocratic background. Uh, lost big territories. That's territory they lost to uh, Brazil, territory they lost to uh, Argentina. Uh, and after that, uh, Paraguay very slowly recovered, but it became a sort of a, a hardcore, uh, ruled by a hardcore right wing party, uh, the Colorado Party. And with Alfredo Stressner at, in office, you can see from 1954 to 1989, uh, you know, hardcore right wing, uh, the interests of the very narrow elite of European background. Uh, the Guarani and, 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 and poor people really, uh, really marginalized. Big tariff barriers, really separate from the rest of Latin America. A lot of Nazis uh, after World War II you know, and, and went to uh, Paraguay where they were, you know, were given refuge. Is, yeah. is Stressner German? Yeah, well, it's certainly a German name. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's quite a few uh, uh, German settlers in many parts of Latin America. There's Parts of Brazil that are fairly heavily German, and uh, so there was German settlement and much Catholic German settlement. Yes, so in Argentina, like in Buenos Aires, there's a whole neighborhood where there's a lot of German Jews and Catholics up dealing with mm. this cash and this land yeah. development. Oh, really? In Bogota. Oh, interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't yeah. think anybody speaks German. Well, <laughs> assimilated eventually. The German Spanish hybrid, that'd be fascinating yeah. to, to, uh, to look at. <laughs> Uh, anyway, though, Paraguay has, like other Latin American countries, it has changed. It has democratized and it has uh, moved uh, to the left. Uh, it's, it's integrated economically with Brazil and uh, Argentina and Uruguay through Mercosur, this organization. But it, you know, it used to be that uh, Paraguay was a, 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 a smuggler's paradise. Uh, I don't know, you've ever been to Ciudad del Este? The, the, uh, the, the well-known uh, city right at the border of, uh, of where the three countries come together. Uh, and it's lots of, uh, even uh, Hezbollah, Lebanese Shiite militia group, huge presence in Paraguay. Uh, 40,000 Lebanese merchants there. Probably they support Hezbollah pretty uh, uh, extensively. So Paraguay is an interesting country. 
But it has changed now, and uh, we have, um, um, let's name this office here, uh, Lugo, right? What's his first name? Ferdinand? Yeah, then Lugo's his last name, just, I, I just can't, can't remember his first name. Anyway, Bishop to the Poor, representative of this, what's uh, called liberation theology, left-wing Catholic movement, uh, democratically elected. There was this big tussle with the Pope because he had to step out of his clerical office to run for president, he did. Uh, he was elected. Uh, here's what's fascinating about him: is uh, he's, he's been called by some the father of the country, and that's not meant to compare to George Washington. That's meant because he has many children, uh, evidently. So uh, there's actually three women now who are suing him for paternity. And, uh, but it's interesting. People say, "Well, you know, I put this in Carl Lyon historical context." When they were down to 28,000 men, how did they survive as a country? Well, they survived because men had children with many different women, and that tradition still continues, and it doesn't matter if you're a bishop or not, evidently. So, <laughs> I don't know if anyone has. And, and this won't affect his political label, right? This, in Latin America, well, this admission of the church of Rome being a top tier in the United States is essentially kind of sort of the exit. Right. All right, that's just fine, right? <laughs> no problem. So we'll, we'll see how he is uh, politically. You know, he says that he's going to be more like uh, a Lula da Silva in Brazil and follow more orthodox economic policies, but then try to reach out to the poor. Uh, we'll see how uh, successful he is there. Peru had a very interesting election. Uh, uh, the winner was uh, Garcia. Again, all the, the names are being uh, wiped out by my little um, volume control here. He had been president. You can see here he had been in office in the 1980s, actually during a period of hyperinflation and big problems, a period when uh, a, a leftist Marxist revolutionary group, the Sendero Luminoso, was uh, running much of, uh, of Peru. Peru was in deep trouble in the 80s, and he was often sort of blamed for, for causing all these problems. But then he's out of office, claims that he's uh, uh, reformed. It's interesting. Ideology, democratic socialism, historical, now social democracy or third way. You know, by third way, we mean centrist. Uh, taking economic ideas from the right, social ideas from the left, uh, putting them together. This is something that Tony Blair championed in Britain for a, a long time. Uh, you know, who, there are, I suppose, different forms of the third way. But he had a very uh, interesting election against uh, Umala, who was, let's see, who had founded one of these very sort of similar to Evo Morales in Bolivia, championing the indigenous people, uh, evoking Peru's ethnic heritage, its origins with the Quechua Native American people, Identified with the Incas, you know, the pre Spanish group. Uh, also, uh, veneration of a 19th century president who led a guerrilla resistance against the occupying Chilean troops. So, back to you know, anti Chilean, anti, uh, anti American, anti capitalist, pro indigenous movement. So, they had a, uh, an election in uh, 2006, and I just had to contrast this with the map of Quechua, different forms of Quechua here, in all these different colors. And then where Umala won, you can see these red areas where he got over 60%, pretty much the Quechua belt. Uh, and the Spanish-speaking zone along the coast, uh, Garcia won that uh, overwhelmingly as well. So a real divide like in Bolivia, but the difference is in Peru, the People who speak Spanish as their first language are the majority, and the Quechua speakers are a minority. But it still has the same highland lowland split, and it's reflected in the uh, voting pattern here as well. El Salvador, small country in Central America, very small, you can see it on some of these maps. Country ripped apart by civil war in the 1980s into the 1990s, and had a sort of hardcore right wing military. Uh, rule, uh, left-wing uh, military uh, insurgency, the 
Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front. Farabundo Marti was a, uh, a Marxist revolutionary leader in the 30s and 40s who was uh, either shot or hanged. I mean, he met a, a nasty death at the hand of El Salvador's our government. It's a poor country. It's very has very unequal distribution of uh, wealth. It had this very uh, nasty war. Uh, but lo and behold, uh, now we have Funes, the uh, who assumed office June first, two thousand and nine. From this, what had been this far left revolutionary Marxist movement, but he's moved to the center, moved to the center uh, very much. He is actually somebody. He well himself. He was he was sort of recruited by this left wing group to be a more modern voice because now they're competing in electoral politics. They can't, you know, uh, they need to move to the center to win. And they did so, and he won fairly narrowly, 51%. Uh, he had been a television reporter, which helped him, uh, but, you know, endorsing moderate political policies, promising better health care and better crime prevention. That's usually a, a policy of the right. Uh, his opponent said that he would herald an era of Venezuelan influence, uh, but he said, uh, no, he's not going to do this. He's promised to keep the U.S. dollar as the currency. Actually, Ecuador has the dollar as the currency as well, as does Panama. There are a number of countries with the dollar. So here you see somebody in a country that historically been run by the hard right. Now you have the left coming into power, but moving into the center to do so. So an interesting case. Guatemala, very similar uh, with uh, Alvaro Colón, uh, first left-leaning president in 53 years. Again, Guatemala, same as El Salvador, very nasty uh, civil war at 80s and 90s, hardcore military right-wing government that uh, used intensive violence, uh, left-wing revolutionary movements that were quite willing to use violence as well. Uh, but now it looks like that's something of the past. I, I, you know, it could always reignite, but right now you have a fairly s uh, center uh, uh, government. What he's saying, he's going to address fighting hunger. Uh, that's going to be his top priority. But it's going to uh, basically sort of maintain fairly cautious overall economic policies. And let's see, I don't want to spend too much time on these. Oh, uh, Honduras, I'll just do very quickly. Uh, Zelaya had been in office. He was aligned himself with Chavez. He had joined the Bolivarian Alternative. What really did him in, though, was drug-related violence. And I should say that's a problem in, a big problem in El Salvador and Guatemala. You know, in El Salvador, one of the biggest problems is people from U.S. prisons who become gang members in U.S. prisons. Then once they're out of prison, they're deported back to El Salvador, and then they run these criminal <laughs> gangs. That's been a problem in Honduras as well. So the drug economy is sort of really undermined. So anyway, he became quite unpopular. There was a coup, a military coup against him. Uh, Obama had denounced the coup and then just worked for months and months with others to try to get the two parts, parties to come together. That is this bizarre incident, you know, where Zelaya was expelled, then he sneaked back in and was hiding out in like a Brazilian embassy, I believe. Lots of sort of weird intrigue. Uh, but anyway, a new election was just held. Uh, Sosa uh, sort of center-right won. Uh, but you can see his main uh, opponent, uh, Elvin Santos, was also a center-right candidate. The left boycotted the election. So... Is it really that clear of a case of democracy? We'll have to see. Uh, Mexico, I'll do quickly as well. So Mexico, uh, 2006, an election that was won by how many votes? I mean, like less than half a percent. I mean, it was just razor, razor thin. Uh, Obrador, a former mayor of Mexico City, definitely on the left. Center left, maybe a little farther left than center left, you could say. Calderon, center right, perhaps. I want to just bring these maps up because here we can find, and here's, here's just showing national GDP per capita, and the correlation is incredibly close. So, uh, wealthy states here uh, is the area around the city of Monterey, 
Uh, what is that? Nueva Leon? It's a state. Yeah, it's a state. state. The state right here. You can see richest state voting very heavily for the more conservative candidate Calderon, voting you know less than twenty percent for Obrador. Uh, it, across the board, you can see the, the wealthier parts in the north. Uh, the one exception would be the federal district here of Mexico City, which is uh, wealthier than most of the rest of the country, but uh, voted uh, with sort of a voting pattern uh, in the middle, essentially, uh, partly because he had, been, had, had this sort of uh, position. And that really, for a long time, Obrador refused to concede. And it looked like Mexico was going to have real political chaos, but eventually he did. They're gearing up for the next election. But what's interesting is both of these parties uh, uh, have lost power recently, and they've gone back to the old party. Now, this guy's got to back up. Every, Mexico had its revolution in 1910, and from then all the way up until, what, 1990s, it was the pre-party, the party of the institutionalized revolution that ran Mexico as basically a one-party state, as a quasi-democracy, a system where you had elections, but everybody knew Pri was going to win because they always won. And they had uh, perfected the art of giving up money uh, to favored people to get the votes. Uh, but it became very... Uh, sort of set in its ways and uh, became much less popular. And what you ended up happening was getting a, a party on the right, the PAN, and a party further to the left, uh, the PRD. And those were the two parties contesting uh, back in this earlier election uh, with the PRI not even in there. But now the PRI has sort of really come back. It's modernized to some extent. And one of the reasons I think that uh, PRI has is done pretty well is because uh, Calderon has really sort of taken on the drug gangs, and that has just led to extreme levels of violence. Violence just sort of spiraling out of control. Not very popular. And so people are thinking, well, maybe back to the tried and true, this party that ran Mexico for so many years, and uh, they are beginning to modernize a little bit, perhaps, and we should give them another chance. Yeah, so he rebay Alvaro Rivera of Colombia. We can talk about him later, although I do want to have time for a more open discussion, so I might just leave one or two more countries. I've got all the rest uh, on slides here, so at least we can uh, look at them. But let me, let me uh, at least get into Brazil, uh, because that is the, uh, the largest country by far in terms of population, in terms of uh, 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 economy. Uh, Lula da Silva, as president, been there since 2003. Uh, was a labor uh, union uh, leader, uh, educated to the fifth grade from the poorest part of Brazil originally, the Northeast, very poor background, worked his way up as a uh, working in, in uh, factories, became a labor uh, union leader, uh, eventually became president, and has steered one of these sort of left center courses. Uh, cautious economic policies, not trying to drive out foreign capital, uh, trying to improve uh, exports and, and build a capitalist economy, but at the same time, try to reach out to the poor through education, health efforts, uh, more progressive taxation system. Uh, and had, it's been quite successful. You can see millions have been lifted out of poverty. The huge gap that was the largest in the world between the rich and the poor, that's it's still big, but nothing like what it used to be. And uh, poll rating still over 70%. You know, he's, you may want to wait till he's out of office before you uh, have a, a, a movie that, uh, that uh, sort of turns him into a saint. But well, and, uh, they've done that. It's uh, the most uh, expensive film ever made in, uh, in Brazil. 
uh, recently out of his, uh, his, his early life, evidently um, changing a few of the important aspects of, of, of his life. But if we look at the voting patterns, I just love that map. It's just so incredibly uh, detailed. Uh, yeah, Lila da Silva won a convincing victory, but it certainly didn't win uh, all districts of Brazil. It's the northeast. That's where he was originally from, although he moved to Sao Paulo when he was fairly young. But that is the poor part of Brazil. Uh, lots of droughts, uh, much more African in its background, uh, very little um, uh, industry. Uh, as you move south, well, the, uh, I'll show you a map of, of uh, economics later, but the economic core is uh, Sao Paulo and Rio area here. The far south is mostly people of European background. And in some of these southern areas, he didn't do so well. A lot of districts here in uh, Santa Catarina where uh, his opponent, who was, uh, who was pretty much a centrist himself anyway, <laughs> did quite well. Also, this area here, Mato Grosso. That is the agricultural boom zone. This is the place right here that was, um, yeah, the Amazonian rainforest is up here. This is the, what's called the Cerrado, it's a savanna grassland. It had been used for very low intensive grazing. In the last 20 years, it has been turned into massive uh, agricultural, um, sorry, agro industry almost. Big farms, soybeans, cotton, corn, uh, highly mechanized, very successful. You know, Brazil has been overtaking the U.S. in soybeans and uh, oranges, many other commodities. And this is the sort of boom zone here. Uh, why Silva did so well in Amazonas and not in Pará, I don't have a clue. Uh, it'd be interesting to try to find out. But if you look at this, it just shows you the uh, <clears throat> per capita GDP. And look, well, look how big it is from the south, over 25,000 areas up here under 5,000, so we got vast differences from the poor northeast to the wealthy south, and that correlates pretty well with the uh, voting pattern. So I mean, we have 20 minutes. I've got, I can do Argentina and Colombia and a lot of other countries, uh, but let me just see what questions and comments. There's no question the discovery of the ego, so what is it doing to the country now? Yeah, that's a good point. So offshore oil reserves, I think they're mostly uh, offshore. And they are substantial. Uh, uh, they're not. It's going to take a long time really to get the oil flowing in a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of huge way. But there's a lot of confidence in the uh, the government of uh, of Lula da Silva that it's going to uh, be able to handle this. We'll see. But uh, I think most people are pretty optimistic about it. Do you have any? So that's a state-owned firm, uh, but they're working with uh, foreign oil companies for the technology. On my friend as well, yes. They use both the sky oil and the Norwegian So they need that offshore uh, experience, right? Because I think it's a pretty difficult drilling environment. It's pretty deep. Norwegians are very good at that. Well, now these new states. Now, in Brazil, I mean, that's been one of their big problems, the shortage of energy. As a result, <coughs> they, they've really moved to the uh, using sugarcane for ethanol, which they can do quite cheaply. So Brazil is, a, is an agricultural superpower, and it's uh, going from strength to strength in that regard. They can produce sugar <coughs> vastly cheaper than the United States can. Uh, U.S. protects the sugar market pretty extensively. Yes? Um, with their agricultural, do you know if they've gone, like, you know, with their approach to Monsanto chemicals, or have they gone sustainable? No, nah, most of this is a, a big agro business, lots of genetically modified organisms. Uh, farming in these uh, in these areas in Mato Grosso, I mean, it, it, it takes lots of, of input because the, the native soils there are really poor. So you need lots of fertilizers, you need trace uh, minerals and the like. Also very tropical, meaning lots of pests. Uh, and weeds and problems, but no, they're going for that stuff, the high tech uh, agriculture. And that's, that's been criticized partly because, uh, you know, a lot of poor, landless people up here, uh, and some of these people are moving into the interior as well, but a lot of this farming is, you know, it's, it's big 
mechanized farming that doesn't employ huge numbers of people, but economically it brings in a lot of money. Have they done, is that where they've done some of the cotton for gun sales to take money out for agriculture? Yeah, the, the biggest area of, uh, of deforestation in the rainforest would be, uh, this is Para State, the southern part uh, over here. So sort of the edge of the Handian rainforest would have been about like so. And it's this zone right here. And a lot of that they've cleared out for, uh, not for crops, but for cattle ranches. Uh, although they're starting to, to farm more of that. Brazil uh, does have a fairly strong environmental movement, though. Uh, Brazilians often claim that the United Americans are far too harsh on them, that the United States spoiled its environment more rapidly than Brazil did. That's um, often said. And there are pretty substantial areas that are under reserve. But that said, a lot of these areas have some, some pretty extreme violence because big land owners will come in and will deforest areas and will also fight against uh, poor people who try to organize, especially if you get like rubber tappers because there's residual rubber in the area. And they'll fight against those people. The new governor, governor of uh, Mato Grosso, I don't know if it's Mato Grosso Sur or Norte, but he was sort of famous as almost <coughs> an ecological criminal because he was guilty of these massive deforestation issues. Now he's portraying himself as a green governor and trying to bring on environmental issues. So environmentalism is, you know, it does have resonance in Brazil. Uh, yes? So um, one of the terms you hear tossed around quite a bit is like this brick. Yeah, right. Know, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Right. And the emergence of Brazil as like this, this global... Uh, economic yeah. power. Why have they, um, it seems like it, people have been waiting for Brazil to kind of exercise that that power for some yeah. time. What, what has propelled them more recently into that formation? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. You know, Brazil had a big economic boom in the 50s and 60s, and then it had several lost decades, 70s, 80s, into the 90s. Brazil had, it had hyperinflation. Uh, not quite as bad as Argentina, but it was Fairly devastating. Uh, plus, this, these, you know, this, these such deep divisions between poor and rich, uh, both poorest parts of the country and in the, the cities, and you know, crime rate in Rio, you know, astronomical. So a lot of these things were really sort of tearing it down. But now, with the, sort of this center-left government, you have economic stability, and you have reduced social tension because there have been these programs for the poor that have helped them quite a bit. Uh, plus this, this, all this, you know, Brazilian agriculture used to be on the coastal zone here, sugar, and then coffee down in here, a uh, mixed agriculture there. But this area here, this is new, and that's the big export surge right now. It's, a, it's this new land. So that's bringing them a lot. Uh, industrially, it's, uh, yeah, it's, fairly, it's fairly successful. Sao Paulo is a huge industrial city, uh, and that's, that's done fairly well. Uh, some people think Brazil is still not sort of performing to its level of capability because its economy has sort of been up and down to, to some extent. But right now, it, it, in agriculture, it's, um, you know, a lot of, I suppose, along with Australia, maybe a few other countries, I mean, it, it, it really is a low cost producer. Produce a lot of crops much cheaper than American farmers do. So that's given an extra uh, sort of plow, I'd say. Yes. Yeah, two questions. One you may have hinted at. There was a time when coffee was the mainstay of Brazil and right. Colombia and other places. Mm -hmm. um, is that a much, what is, what's happened? Did they just diversify out of that? So that there was coffee, yes. So coffee in, yes, in, in Colombia, even parts of Venezuela, but Colombia more so, Costa Rica. Sao Paulo area of Brazil. Uh, one issue is more competitors. Uh, Vietnam went on a massive coffee planting campaign in the 90s. And actually, I think Vietnam surpassed Brazil as the top coffee producer. I have to check the numbers. Uh, coffee market just wasn't growing enough, and it's just not a big enough market really to, 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 to base an economy on. And uh, a lot of the African countries, Ethiopia and uh, other growing coffee as well. So I think there's sort of more competition and just sort of not enough, sort of a mature market, basically. Um, it's, it's 
hard to get people to drink more coffee than they already were. I just want to point out of what you get. But it's still very important in Brazil uh, and in Colombia as well, and in Costa Rica, and in a number of countries, it's still very, very important as well. One more question. Sure. Um, do they have the same kind of drug problems that we find in other parts of Brazil? Brazil has huge drug problems in the slums, especially. So you've got, as you say, in the slums of Rio, there's a lot of areas that the drug dealers basically control those zones. And the police often don't even go in them, and if they do, uh, historically, they've just gone in and, and basically done what do they call it, extra jurors, juridical killings, you know, just trying to identify and kill the drug lords. Now they're, they're trying to move to more, more regular policing to try to get more police presence in the slums, but to do so in a sort of above board legitimate way. Uh, that's a, a policy that they're pushing. But uh, uh, Rio, Rio is just selected for the uh, next Olympics, right? So that's given a big issue because the, the crime and the drugs in those slums of Rio are, are still a pretty extreme problem. And I think it'd be working really hard to, to make things better at least. And then the, the general trends have been, uh, have been uh, improving. Brazil doesn't have the problem of being a yeah, in Colombia, you have the, the sort of the nerve center of the cocaine trade globally, and then Mexico is this transit into the United States, and that's what's really uh, been so problematic there. Brazil, it's, uh, it's just local use is, is, is the problem, and drug lords having um, power in these really poor areas. There's yes. been oh. some articles, haven't there, about with the Olympics coming? Yeah. And basically, the army going in and uh, you know uh, removing yeah. for, from some of these areas, and they're starting with, with the smaller uh, ones in, in an effort to clean them out, uh, bring police forces yeah. in into uh, these uh, areas where are yeah. controlled by the people. Yeah, absolutely. Areas that have just never been police, generally, yeah. like where the, the drug dealers have just basically had to say there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's a but the countries that are use the dollar as a currency, they don't have any ability to make their own dollar. So they just rely on the U.S. currency. Yes. Uh, uh, so in El Salvador, Panama, uh, Ecuador, that have dollarized. Yeah, they're not. They don't have a mint. They're not making their own. I never really thought about that. Does anybody know how, how that how that works? Are they importers? Yeah, I mean that that happens. So happy. basically, they're getting money from us. Uh, it's, it must be beneficial for the U.S. Treasury. I don't <laughs> think it would be happening. Uh, I'm afraid you're beyond my full knowledge on, on that issue. But uh, I mean, it shows how close they were historically uh, to the United States. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, please. Oh, uh, just a comment back uh, to the earlier question about like the. Right. Oh, I think what, what, what Brazil sort of brings to the bargaining table yeah. is um, sort of the capacity of the rainforest as, as a carbon sink. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good yeah. point. So, uh, <laughs> I, in other words, I think, well, well China's China. <laughs> and, and India, you know, they have massive populations. That was sort of, that, that's what they brought. But um, the, the rainforest, you know, if they can trigger, if, we'll have to see how, how uh, things evolve in terms right. of global climate yeah. talks and the end of some sort of system for you know, carbon cap and trade and all just gets worked out. But then, then that might be where the rainforest might be. Yeah. It's a big monetizable thing. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting point. I've been sort of suspicious of the BRIC idea because what do Brazil and Russia really have in common economically? It seems like very different sort of economic systems and not that much common ground. Uh, some frustration perhaps with the United States and the European Union for their dominant roles in international economic organizations. Yeah, they would consider that interesting. But otherwise, that their sort of bases are pretty, pretty different. I think that the idea is that the countries put together the collaborative American economies, which are not directly partial to the hmm. like you might do in Africa. Oh. Everybody recognizes that great countries are, in fact, emerging in quite different ways. Right. So it's a diversification technique for international investment. Thank you. That's very helpful. 
Yeah. You mentioned the presence of Hezbollah in um, Paraguay. In right. And was it also present the presence in Venezuela? Or yes, I understood. What are they doing? Well, yeah. Yeah. first of all, I'd like to say the, the Lebanese have a global diaspora. You know, there's, there's certain groups of people who have, have for hundreds, if not longer periods, had these, these uh, far flung mercantile networks. So, Lebanese, Armenians, and Jews, they, they, they have had these, these big uh, organizations. So, you can go up into you know, the most remote areas in Central Africa and find a little outpost, good chances you're going to find Lebanese there operating. And the same in Latin America. There's lots, there are lots of Lebanese who move. Some Christian Lebanese, some Muslim uh, Lebanese. For example, uh, former president of uh, Argentina was Carlos Menem. I think he was referred to as El Turco, the Turk. <laughs> he wasn't Turkish, he was Lebanese. But uh, uh, yeah, they're very important in, in a number of areas. Uh, but then, uh, where uh, Hezbollah is a Shiite militia in southern Lebanon, organized to fight against Israel when Israel was occupying southern Lebanon, uh, and they've been able to tap into the Shiite Lebanese communities elsewhere, and especially in places where there's a lot of smuggling, uh, that gives them sort of entree into an illicit economy and a way to funnel money into their operations. And they've also even been involved in. I think they were involved in a big cigarette smuggling operation in the U.S., taking cigarettes from low-tax southern states to high-tax northern states. Do you remember that? Am I, am I misremembering that? Yeah. Uh, so it's you know it's it's a very global organization. It has to do with the Lebanese diaspora being so widespread in Central America. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Please. So going back to Mexico for a second. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about the, the current Mexican central government. Uh, cracking down on the on the drug transshipment organization right. yeah. and how that had backfired. It sounds like politically because of the Russian violence. Right. So what was the political upside of doing this? Was this a corruption fight or was it a yeah? Why did they start this in the first place? Well, so you have these crime syndicates, and there's a number of them. There's what La Familia. There's a group called the Zetas who were originally in the Mexican security apparatus. Right? Does anyone know this story? I believe they were. Uh, and then they went rogue, and they went turned to the other side. Uh, and so they're actually, I, I couldn't find a map, but I have seen maps that show these different crime syndicates that control different areas of uh, Mexico. I recently read an article about the uh, state of Sinaloa here, which has a lot of these drugs, but uh, there's one crime syndicate that controls it all, so they don't have the infighting, and so it hasn't been as violent. But in a number of areas, Juarez was brought up on the border with uh, El Paso, Texas. There you've had different groups fighting amongst themselves, and very corrupting of the overall political institutions, paying off police, paying off uh, uh, prosecutors, and then getting into the kidnapping racket. Uh, so kidnapping really was becoming epidemic, and you had to, and when you, know, you start getting this sort of epidemic kidnapping, then it's really striking pretty close to the heart of the society. And so a lot of people, you know, they had just had enough. And so I think there was a lot of enthusiasm at first that the government would be able to take them on. But they proved themselves uh, a match in many areas. I mean, the most recent one was this killing of a party of teenagers. That was in Juarez, I believe, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. They didn't even know what, what, why they did it. Was, it. was it they had the wrong address or something? But uh, you know, the levels of, of violence were pretty horrific. But so there was some level of some intolerable level of drug violence, and yeah. this is the central government trying to squash that and instead of making it worse. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of complaints in Mexico that the real problem is the market to the north in the United States. Uh, and a lot of people think that the, the U.S. is sort of exporting this problem in a way to Mexico. I mean, that's one way to look at it. A lot of drugs are consumed in Mexico, but most of them are coming through into the United States. Yes. How did um, Corleone have the Japanese presence in the United States? <laughs> yeah, what, what's the uh, historical connection? Yeah, he was very popular for a while because he was seen as overthrowing the Sendero Luminoso, and then he would have to be charged on corruption charges. Uh, just like there were Lebanese immigrants, there was also quite a, a large number of immigration from Japan and China as well. Most of the Japanese immigration to Brazil. Sao Paulo state has over a million people of Japanese background, so it's very substantial. Uh, not as many in Peru, that you find more uh, Chinese population in Peru. And that's a, a continuing movement of people from China into Latin America. I was uh, in, in Belize uh, summer and a half ago, 
Yeah, most of the stores are, are run by Chinese people. And you talk to the people at Belize, and they love it and they hate it. They love it because these are efficient stores with cheap prices, and they hate it because the native people can't compete with them. So you get, uh, so that's an, an ongoing movement. Uh, Peru was a Peru was the leading fishing nation of the world in the oh. 1970s. Fishing, 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 fishing nation yeah. of the world, a combination of um, El Nino's that became more um, food brands, as opposed to El Nino's happening every 15 years, now they're happening every two or three years. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the lack of regulation uh, in the food and uh, fishing industry has collapsed, but it was, you know, at a time they were the leading fishing nation, and so the combination of fishing industries in, in, uh, in Japan, there was a lot of, you know, <laughs> After World War, after World War II, Japan destroyed a lot of Japanese looking to take their trade to someplace else, including in Africa. So that's how. So that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that connection. But yeah, Peru has this real cold current, the Humboldt Current, which results in very, very productive waters. But as was just mentioned, it's really not as productive as they used to be. Uh, we probably have just time for one more question. Yeah, there's a, there's a comment about the Japanese in Brazil and Peru. Apparently now Japanese are sort of importing a lot of people back from Brazil because they don't have like a lot of young population. Yeah. So a lot of Brazilian immigrants to the point that there's actually they're thinking about bilingual education. Yeah. So Portuguese and um, and Japanese for now. For for the children of these immigrants, I see I had a visiting scholar here at Stanford who was working on this project for one of the developmental programs. Uh, I met several uh, uh, Brazilians of Japanese background in, in Japan a few years ago, precisely this situation. And boy, were they complaining about culture shock. Because <laughs> Brazilian culture and Japanese culture, a lot of issues are diametrically opposed. The way people carry their bodies and the like. You know, one's very reserved, why not? And they were having a real difficult time because they're Brazilian. Thanks for the update. I guess we are out of time for that. Thank you so much. And uh, I, uh, this is uh, pe thank you for those who sent me suggestions. Uh, I've had a uh, request to talk about uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Somalia, former Yugoslavia, uh, India, Nepal area, uh, Sweden. Uh, anything else? So, so those are sort of the requests that have come in. I'll send you all an email within a day or two after I relax a little bit about what next Tuesday will bring us. Feel free to send me uh, recommendations uh, if, if there's something you'd like to talk about. Thank you. Oh, well, if you're, if you're taking class for a grade, then I, I do have, oh, yes, right here. So this is just the syllabus, and that just explains it right there. It's very short. Feel free to send me an email. Uh, do, I, do I have my email on? Oh, yeah. OK. Oh, there it is. Sure, there it is. There it is, yeah. Oh, there's probably you could do it. Okay. Good. Okay, thanks. Well, given that we're having our census this year, how about oh. taking a look at it? our maps? Oh, look at the U.S., yeah. yeah. Could, you, could you do something pretty interesting there? That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm still picking around a couple ideas or so. Okay. About, you know, what to do for papers. So, no, very. Right. So, so, yeah, I'll, I'll email you. Okay, that's good. Thanks much, Martin. It was good. Thank uh, you. Good lecture. We enjoyed it. And, uh, I'll save my questions until we get together sometime. Okay, so okay. you're you, do you need any help getting out? You're no no no. We're down on the uh palm drive, so okay. we're good shape. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Good to see you again. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, okay. Um what what's the what's going on? Because nothing is happening there. What's going on? Because you I can only be in the studio like a couple of floors, so I think the point was We've been hearing so many stories about nasty places with lots of war and people killing each other and so. You were about to become one of the kind of like that. Well, there are some problems in Sweden. Uh,
There's a lot of tensions in Malmo, especially. In well, I read about them. Yeah. Actually, I read pretty well about tensions in Malmo. Yeah, Malmo, that's a quick. So, so I, that was just something someone suggested. So. Oh. <laughs> All right. How about Slovakia? <laughs> yeah, I guess. The, I don't know. I'm not yeah. cool. <laughs> it's always cool. Um, um, Jan Slota. We can talk about Jan Slota. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. That's more like a folklore thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's Yeah, he's fading. Yeah, but he's really close to that many parts. It's pretty rough. Yeah, he's in there. He's in yeah, well, that's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> There's election this year, I guess. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I think so. It's very strange that ideas that already had a boom and lots of work mm. in Russia mm. are now becoming so popular in places like Bali. Uh, <laughs> you should kind of read about it. Yeah, try it all over again. Right. <laughs> Oh yeah, when, when I hear this like uh, third way oh, and yeah, center, yeah. I'm, I'm just getting I know. I know. I know. Yes. I know. 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 I I'm sorry, it's like, it's like a narcotic oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, they stick up plenty of money. Because, uh, well, you know. Yeah. It's interesting right. how it was on this map of different types of democracies and different types oh. of countries. It said, what is it, like semi presidential? <laughs> 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 is that like dual presidential yeah, or something? Yeah, it's like you know? <laughs> France, you got a president and a prime minister. Like Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Russia now well, is really. No, not like, really, because I mean, we don't know all the presidents have any power, right? It's just the same guy only now who is prime minister. Yeah, it used to be that the president had power, now the prime minister. <laughs> but but, but it's, really, it's, it's the same person. It's really kind of odd, and it's not what I expected, because in Russia, um, the guy who wins is the guy who's sitting in Kremlin. It doesn't matter mm. how far you are, it's important that you're sitting mm. in, in Kremlin. And now Putin is not in Kremlin, so it's relating that he's still able to. So Unfortunately, power, to yeah. he's been having these these public disagreements with Medvedev. Mm -hmm. Is it a real disagreement, or is it all just like? Oh, like every day, yeah. I don't. Know. I see an article. People are trying to get. Is it real? Disagreement, <laughs> or are they like pretending to do that? Uh, you know, yeah. it's it's like yeah. we always think whenever these conflicts come, it's like, okay, what's really happening? <laughs> I think Putin tells me it's really important to disagree. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 it's yeah. not the other way around for sure. Does he really want to change the? He did want to do that, and then he essentially then he decided against it. He's just going to wait it out, out because he can win again now. Oh, he can? Right. So he can be president, prime minister, president, yeah, right. prime minister. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. But it's not clear if that would work, because there are probably still some actual real disagreements, because Putin is trying to humiliate him with his own team. Like, you can say to go abroad, and Putin sometimes is very emotional. So he's a calculated person, but Sometimes it seems like he cannot like rein in his own emotions. So when Medvedev goes abroad and has some agreement with mm -hmm. other powers, Putin is trying to like say well. Undermine mm -hmm. him. Yeah. Well, the big issue now is the Ukrainian election coming up. Oh yeah. A few days or something. I don't know. It would be interesting to see how the voting and again the languages sort of match up because there's part of Ukraine mm -hmm. that, that are more Ukrainian speaking and parts that are more Russian speaking. You want to see a map? Yeah. <laughs> For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.